my introductory talk will be about digital democracy. Is there actually a future for democracy? And if so, how may it look like? For those who are fans of the complexity science hub, they may remember that we had had a workshop back in 2017 on reinventing society in the digital age. And since then, actually also before we have been working on that subject. So what can we reinvent about society, how it works? And we had another workshop also here at the Complexity Science Hub, which happened to be on September 11, 2018. Such a meaningful date, the same date as today, where we tried basically to override this terrible history by some positive future to be brought about by Climate City Olympics. Now today my talk will be about digital democracy. We all know that the world is faced with big challenges. Sustainability is one of our biggest challenges. I think there are a few people who doubt that. Uh, for that reason, the United Nations came up with 17 sustainable development goals back in 2015. In fact, there are more than 170 targets. But most of the time, we're just talking about one of them. And uh, the question is, is that really enough? And why is this happening? You know, there are some people who have basically proposed that we could or should be saving the world. Um, basically with a war room approach. So we would basically put together all the data about this planet in a huge data center to build a prediction machine and a machine that would basically allow us to control the future. This has been built. A digital twin of the world and its people has been built. And actually one of those systems is called Sentient World Simulation, goes back uh, many years actually. And you can imagine that in these times where we have the internet of things and even nanotechnology and internet of bodies and um, internet of uh, bio nano uh, things that we can know a lot about this earth and we can have a very detailed digital twin. But is it really a digital copy that is a like reality or is it more like deep fake? And this is really an important question. If only 1% of parameters are wrongly specified, what would that mean in situations when we talk about life and death situations? So I've thought about this approach a long time and I think it's not expected to work well. And that's, I think, also the lesson that the public has recently learned when people really big shots in the area of AI have suddenly collectively warned the world of existential threats, which I think really has to be seen in that context of being able to run an AI system that would manage or control the world in many aspects. What could go wrong? I mean, you know that ChatGPT is a wonderful thing, but on the other hand, it comes up with lots of lies when it comes to you know, references, citations, and all these kind of things, and also many other uh, plausibly sounding things. But in many facts, it's fake news, unfortunately. So what does that mean if that technology is being used to run planet Earth? Probably there would be some issues. But, Democracy has not only been under pressure by military thinking, which is always about power and control, but also by companies. And uh, for example, a company that was called Facebook in the past, now Meta, um, they basically came up with this um, and break things. And uh, that could also include, of course, democracy and human rights, if you don't pay attention. 
There is a famous quote that says, democracy is an outdated technology. It has brought wealth, health, and happiness for billions of people all over the world, but now we want to try something new. <laughs> Sounds a bit concerning, to be honest. Peter Thiel, you know very well, he says we are in a deadly race between politics and technology. The fate of our world may depend on the effort of a single person who makes the world safe for capitalism. I guess he was thinking perhaps of himself. Um, you know, he, he, he's running Palantir in particular, one of the worst surveillance systems altogether in this world, I guess. Um, and many businesses have been suggesting that we could run cities like a business. And you may remember that Geoffrey Vest and others, including myself, have always warned that this is not going to work well. But it brings us to the issue of smart cities, which is about the commercialization of cities, among others. Not just about sensors and intelligence and, you know, putting a lot of sensors does not necessarily make cities smart um, right away. But what has certainly happened is that cities have been put under a microscope and that means our life has been looked into quite in some detail, in many cases, without our knowledge and consent. And um, Larry Page of Google said, I think as technologists, we should have some safe places where we can try out some new things and figure out what is the effect on society, what's the effect on people without having to deploy them into the normal world. And people who like uh, those kinds of things can go there and experience that, but we don't have mechanisms for that. So to put it a little bit more simple, he wanted to have experimental space where he could just reinvent the world and societies and do what he wants and come up with a future society. And this is what has happened, actually, in some cities, uh, some Google cities, um, including the fraud waterfront um, project in Toronto. And actually, people didn't like it so much because they have been asked and in fact people got very much worried about this being some kind of modern so what is going wrong here the next thing is that um, you may ask yourself um, how many cities actually are there in europe that are smart so could you guess Say a number. 30? 5? Zero. zero. All. Okay. So we have between 0, 5, 30, and all. And, and this is what you find in the document EU agenda. 240 European cities. Could you name them at all? What do we know about it? You know? Um, doesn't democracy imply that there should be transparency on how our money is spent and what kind of algorithms are being used and run, you know, to manage the city? We know nothing, and most likely because things went wrong in Toronto, so they saw, <laughs> if people don't know, it will be okay. But is it really okay? Uh, this is something that we have to talk about. Now, there has been this idea of a data-driven AI-controlled benevolent dictator. And the data would, of course, be created by surveillance, Internet of Things, basically. And the question is, what would such a benevolent dictator do? You know, let's suppose we were a benevolent dictator. So we were in control of the world, and we just wanted to do good things. Is this going to be working out well? Well, a benevolent dictator would uh, prefer to have a planable, predictable, and controllable world. And in fact, um, that fits well to a data-driven society. And in fact, um, 
the concepts for a data-driven society have been gone so far, as you can see over here in a document that was put out by the Ministry of Interior in Germany. Um, could be going so far that we would have a post-choice and a post-voting society. Are we still needed? Or are we just a disturbance of the perfect smart city? So surely this is not well compatible with democracy and freedom, but it could still be a perfect city. Could it? That's the question I will discuss this evening when we uh, have the panel discussion, smart cities, digital zoo or participatory society. And you can imagine a digital zoo sounds a little bit like animal farm, you know, like uh, are we going to end up in a digitally controlled society? And um, what can we do about it? Now we have been critical about it already many years back. We put out what was uh, got to known as digital manifesto, but the title really was digital democracy rather than data dictatorship. And why is this? And in fact, uh, the title has made it also on a book title uh, from Brittany Kaiser. Uh, she's uh, reported about Cambridge Analytica and the scandals around it. And um, I think she became quite famous. And so the subject of digital democracy is out there and also of data dictatorship. Now, a benevolent dictator you know, would probably do the following, determine our, or everyone's actually individual goal functions or utilities as economists would say, um, then determine an average and then find an optimal solution to this average utility function and then implement it. This is one of the really widespread paradigms that we have today and <laughs> what, what happens is that we would have the perfect solution for somebody who doesn't exist. There is no average person. So in other words, we don't have a perfect solution for anybody. And so optimization, strangely enough, even though the word sounds so grandiose and so positive, you know, is perhaps the problem. Goal functions are one dimensional because you know you want to compare two solutions. Is this better or worse? You need to have a greater or a smaller relationship, mathematically speaking. But societal needs are multidimensional. We want to have prosperity, sustainability, health, education, culture, happiness, and peace, and you know, you name it, a lot more. So Goal functions tend to oversimplify societies dramatically, I would say, and their needs. And the result is a poly crisis. I think this is a human generated poly crisis that comes from the application of the wrong concept for the wrong kind of problem. So the question then is, are there any other ways to decide? Yes, of course, vote. Voting does not require an average utility function. Voting works for very different people in a pluralistic society. Diversity is not an issue. That's why we vote. However, yes, no majority voting even though the most common approach is among the worst voting methods ever. And there are various issues, including what people sometimes call the tyranny of the majority, or tyranny of the majority. Some people think it's happening in some countries these days, perhaps it has always been happening. But when we come back to cities, we see quite clearly what the negative implications of majority voting are. 
Because if you only go about the majority of votes, then those districts of a city that have more voters will always win. And that tends to be the center of the city. While the periphery basically gets very little. And this is a typical situation that we know from many cities around the world, and it creates the phenomenon of banlieues, um, you know, poor areas of the city uh, with a lot of violence and desperation and deprivation. And we also have the city hinterland divide. So, you know, this happens since many decades and nobody did anything against it. And one of the reasons is that we used the wrong voting rule. Nobody was even thinking about it. So let's look into voting. So what is it about? First of all, it's about us, the voters, um, and our preferences. And the important point is that we should be able to somehow measure those preferences. There are different ways to do that or uh, come and talk about it a little bit. And then once we have the voting input, we will have to vote do a voting a vote aggregation in order to figure out what will finally be done. That's the democratic outcome, okay? Now, in order to look into this, we have created an app. It's called Vote App. And it allows to look into different kinds of voting methods and what are the implications of those. And so there are different kinds of ways to measure voting input. Approval voting is the most common, perhaps, where you have a list and you can basically approve some options or not. This is not a very detailed measurement of your preferences. There's a better way, which is called combined approval voting. And here you can approve, disapprove, or abstain. But there are also other ways like rank voting, so-called border score, and you can uh, basically rank options according to your preferences. Or you could actually distribute a certain number of points, say 10, over those options that are there. And not only choose the options that you like, but also indicate the strengths of your preference. So you can express your preferences a lot better than with approval voting, okay? So we can improve the voting process, which is the important point here. Now, what happens then in the ballot box? So basically we have to aggregate, right? And for majority voting, it's just the projects that have most votes that um, are being approved and will be implemented. In some cities, not even this, uh, but <laughs> okay. Uh, what we have forgotten completely here in the majority voting is the cost of the project. Each project comes with a cost, right? And perhaps we should be considering this. And um, this can be done um, in different ways, and it's very important and of particular interest in the context of so-called participatory budgeting. Here, the city council puts away some money that will be decided by the citizens and how to use it. And basically, uh, we can have different kinds of aggregation here. So optimal knapsack, for example, looks at the vote to cost ratio. So more expensive projects need more votes to be approved. And that results in a different list of projects to be chosen. Or we can have the method of equal shares where you get a virtual amount of money that will be distributed uh, over the projects. And those projects that get enough money to be realized will be uh, put into reality. Now, what is important about this is those different voting methods lead to different outcomes. You can see that very clearly, that the distributions look very different over here. And this has the potential of including 
minority interests, for example, have a lot more broadly distributed outcomes, which benefits more groups of society. And that is what we probably need in order to make better cities of the future. And in fact, this is not just theory. Participatory budgeting is around for already some time. Barcelona is one of the famous cities in this context, but there are many more. And recently we had the opportunity to uh, do this participatory budgeting together with the city of Aarau in Switzerland. So you can see some people in the room who were involved. Um, and you, you can see over here, it's a process that requires engagement of the citizens. It uh, is a process that goes over many months, even more than a year if you do it well. And you have to prepare for it well, you have to announce it well. And um, there is a certain process that you have uh, to uh, do. And first it starts with uh, the collection of ideas and then they have to be made more concrete and eventually there will be a vote and an implementation, right? And so you can see over here, this is how it works. So the citizens assemble those who are interested and there would be a collection of ideas. There's a deliberation going on and many uh, different ideas would be proposed. And there's brainstorming, you know, you can see the Mentimeter over here, what this is all about, unfortunately over here in German. And, um, then those ideas are put on the map and says uh, our 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 ideas and uh, now you see all those uh, different sticky notes those are ideas that have been proposed on that evening and um, eventually they have to be worked out to be made more concrete and so basically uh, the spectrum of, of ideas is narrowed down um, by consideration of practicality and also is there enough support and engagement uh, to really make it happen. And in the end, there were around, um, I think, 32 proposals that citizens had to vote about. Quite a lot, I think, um, shows really a lot of engagement and this engagement was also promoted uh, by um, going out of the city hall and uh, putting posters into uh, the area, even at bus stops, um, to make people engage with the city and with the project. And so then there was a final countdown. People were spreading their votes, their points over the different projects. For this, they were informed well about how the procedure works in principle. So they understand what they have to do, distribute those points over different projects according to their liking. And that um, in order to be successful with a certain choice, um, projects which uh, have to gather enough votes also considering the cost of the project. And this is what was the result. So in fact, the winning projects generally had a better vote to cost ratio. Uh, you see the ones with the uh, uh, full dots on, on, on the left. So they tend to be above a certain diagonal line. And so this worked out well. And rather than just 70 projects according to a majority voting rule, we had 17 instead. And rather than having those projects uh, concentrated in the center, as it would have been according to the majority rule, those projects are spread out all over the city. So there are a lot more happy people over here. Plus trust was um, generated through transparency and um, there was more voter satisfaction because people understood what was going on and uh, this is, of course, very important. You will hear more about this in the course of the week. Regula, for example, is with us. Uh, Vangelis is with us. And so in conclusion, democracy can be upgraded. In fact, there are many ways to do this. I just told you about 
how we can improve democracy by changing the voting rule, but there are other approaches based on collective intelligence, crowdsourcing, crowd sensing, citizen science, hackathons, fab labs, makerspaces, open innovation, co-creation, open source urbanism, city Olympics, challenges or city cups, uh, which also can help to improve democracy. So there are many possibilities and I've been talking about them uh, many times. Also over here in Vienna, and we have basically engaged in most or even all of those different techniques and researched them. So in conclusion, one should implement more democracy, not less. And democracy should not be about winning against others. That's my conclusion. Uh, but democracy should be about pluralistic solutions. I mean, not everyone doing the same thing, not everyone agreeing necessarily on the same thing, but doing different things that all make progress. Pluralistic solutions which support collective intelligence and catalyze benefits for many. Adaptation rather than prediction, co-evolution rather than planning and cooperation rather than control. So be a game changer. You can change the rules. And if you do that, there's going to be a better world. Thank you very much. So who, who wants to basically chair the discussion just for a few minutes? So Stefan, perhaps, could you do that? Are there any questions or comments? Um, yes. And there you're talking about you have a massive question, this question is democracy, and the English kind of um, the reason why we need this model for the argument is these decisions are so complex. The XAP is the basic phenomenon, but also the time scale. So, do you think this kind of method can be applied to uh, situations where decisions are far more complex, far more complex than, let's say, if there is isn't the need to shut down the ground of expertise to be able to train them? Absolutely. So I'm still a fan of digital technologies. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I think everything depends really on how we make use of technology. And digital trends can be useful in certain contexts. Um, but when it comes to people and society, then they don't work very well because there's so many other things that matter. Um, however, how to make best use of such big data repositories and um, powerful technologies like digital twins is to change the paradigm from a war room approach to what we call a peace room approach, which would um, basically require a multidisciplinary approach. So different perspectives would require a lot more openness, participatory opportunities, an ethical perspective, uh, democratic kind of views, so I, I do think uh, we can use those technologies in better ways than they've been used in the past by opening them up for participation. And we now learn how to do that. So um, the, the question is now how, how to read the word partici uh, a representative democracy, right? And there are two ways of reading it. One that I tend to agree with is that the parliament should represent the different perspectives of the people and make sure that those are sufficiently being taken into account and taken care of. There's another interpretation of representative democracy, which basically means that we uh, elect representatives that, who are then kind of the benevolent dictators for the next four years. 
like a king or a kaiser, you know, in the past, in a sense. This is what I don't agree with. Uh, I think we all see that this, this is not what is working. In many countries, we see that people are spreading out over ever more parties um, and coalitions get ever wider with ever more parties because people are not satisfied with a majority ruling over everyone. They want a government to take care of everyone and not just of the fans of the government parties. And that is the issue. And, 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 and in fact, the um, participatory budgeting approach is representative of the wishes of the people, but it's not represented through the intermediation of parties. Still, the city council is basically moderating everything. So, you know, they're still <laughs> the boss of this process. But, you know, if they do their job well, they will let this happen pretty, pretty much bottom up. And so we'll see in the coming years, you know, will this budget for participatory budgeting be, be increased? So to make this bottom up component more um, powerful or whether it will be reduced, which will be possible because we're not talking about a lot of money right now. Um, but I, I do think there's a lot of potential here and we should have the courage to experiment with these new approaches. I guess. I think for a group like us, you know, much to the sympathy of the Chinese, you know, which is a political society in this industry, I think we, we have to have a sense to the ability of what the problem is, right? What is the problem we are? What is the problem we want to wonder about? And it's just that that's true because it's clearly public, right? Uh, that allows human society to be wrapped with each other, to honor it, and to evolve in, in many fashions. But that means that it's not really just about voting, right? If you look at any political system there, and of course, the elite saw the city as a political machine, and the city is always going to be like all politics. But, but if you do look at any political system that sort of works, it's hard to be done works perfectly, some parts of the system are perfect, it's easy to be all of that. But that system who balances checks and balances and sort of a dynamic tension that allows them to do lots of complicated things. So, for example, the vote regime. But then there's a system of laws. There's law enforcement in particular and judicial system. They enforce the rights of minorities, which are always in French, right? Uh, and, 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 and then there's an executive branch, otherwise things all move, right? So the people are making decisions in your land, but then they're under certain conditions, right? They don't have absolute power. So it's something like this that kind of have ways of working that really seem to be the best political system we ever built. But understanding those, I think, then allow us to start thinking about how digital tools come into the picture and can help us increase transparency, even checks the power, but also giving the power where it should be, and so on. So, can you speak a little bit to this bigger picture? Maybe this is the agenda for the next few days. But I'm afraid of just narrowing it down to 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 uh, to voting or to other aspects of the problem right so i fully agree with you and uh, in some other slide sets i have one slide about um or several about value sensitive design and design for democracy and then the question what are those values and all those issues come in like check and balances and protection of minorities and the rule of law and and, and those things they all matter i i fully agree but traditionally, we do think about the role of governments and law to um, the, and the judiciary system to basically restrict companies and people in what uh, they're uh, about uh, they should be doing. And uh, people don't typically, and companies even less so, like uh, constraints. And uh, the question is, are there other ways to make sure that minorities are doing well? For example, to mention just this uh, problem that has been around for a long time. Uh, do we have to enforce that uh, minorities um, are treated well? And in many cases, probably yes. But 
here we have a new way of empowerment that gives citizens more power to create a world of their liking. And um, these new voting rules allow to take uh, into account minority interests better without harming the interests of the majority. This is the interesting point. It just gives a more pluralistic system where um, those different groups that we have in our society, which are all important, I think, um, are creating something like um, a, a catal uh, catal catalysis. Um, so they're, they're, they're all allowing good things to happen by the interaction between those different actors and groups and institutions. And this was what it should be aiming for, some system of symbiosis that will be promoted actually by such a new voting approach. Yes? Mm -hmm. I think this is a absolutely fair point, um, but it applies probably to all different possible organizations of uh, societies. You know, each system can be hacked in a sense. And um, we need to take measures to protect ourselves against that. I do think, though, that having more options, how to organize our social interaction, also how to spend public money on projects and so on, will altogether benefit society. Because in many situations, particularly in pluralistic societies, there's probably not one thing fits all. And so while kind of um, the representative system works probably well for the big groups in society that are hopefully reasonably well represented in the chambers of democracy, it doesn't work well for minorities, which however are also important for a society to function well. So in principle, you could set aside a certain amount of budget and reserve it for minority issues that need to be addressed, um, rather than deciding all the budget by the parliament, right? So just to give an example that um, we have options that we perhaps haven't made uh, enough use of in the past. And um, the good news is there's a lot more innovation potential for democracies of the future than we thought. And just by varying some of the procedures of our democracies, we can innovate democracy, we can upgrade it and we can refresh it. And so I think it can be more effective than in the past, but I also believe it will be more effective than a benevolent dictator approach that has so often been uh, advocated in the recent past. And that's why we should really spend some effort developing it, trying it out and implement it where it works. Speaking of suggestions for PR or voting processes, have you also discussed the concept of weighting the votes again? You know, there's been this idea on reflecting the remaining lifespan of the voter. So, but then again, you have weighted votes. Have you addressed the 
No, we did not. Um, that is certainly also something one should look into, but spontaneously, I could not really say w or why we should uh, wait um, uh, the life of a person of this age more or less than a person of that age. I, I think uh, all of us need attention by uh, the collective of the society and so I'm, I'm 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 not sure that's going to be um, a solution to some of the big issues that we face. But yeah, one should probably anyway study these kind of things. Um, Victoria, thanks a lot for putting a spotlight on these issues. Just with this philosophy, going back to what Louis was saying about what is the big problem we are having. So I guess we are discussing two different scales. You know, the scales of particularly budgeting is a small scale here. Yeah? You have the budget, number of people, and level of problems, right? Okay. And in this case, people are voting for the project, voting for an idea. Okay. At the larger scale, you vote for someone who would have ideas to be the manager. Okay. So at some point, between the small scale and the large scale, you lose your empowerment, your power, your position, and you decide. Right? So I guess one of the big challenges for all of us is how to bridge the gap between these two scales. We all know that it's working at a small scale. Your example is a good example. There are many more we can put. We have no examples on the large scale of something working in that direction. Because at some point, we feel totally, I mean, the boundary of any possible power to say what's better. Even if we have the good ideas, okay, there are no ways in which these good ideas can actually calculate at the parliament level. And, uh, and I guess if we try to solve this problem, then we can try to implement all the uh, counterbalances in decision making. Okay. We could have a situation with uh, in the ecosphere and the and the uh, news and the GDP, whatever number, it's probably you can make the situation even worse. But I guess I mean, probably the problem is that the content can be more maybe this period. We probably address the problem of what is wrong when you go from the small scale to the large scale? All right. So um, the, the the question is whether we should be aiming for a system that basically implements homogeneous rules everywhere on ever larger scale. You know, it started perhaps with um, federal countries and became countries and European Union, the ever bigger scales with the same rules. And is that always the best solution or do we lose some valuable diversity that would uh, trigger innovation and collective intelligence and uh, trying out various solutions to figure out what really works in practice. And I therefore believe that cities and regions are a good scale where, first of all, the problems are where also the solutions can be implemented, where people still can come in, and where we can basically also implement um, diversity because not every city and region would have to do exactly the same thing if the national government allows for that. So, you know, I think we, we could be a lot more innovative over here, but altogether, I believe that voting on projects is something that can also be generalized to a bigger scale. So I don't think that uh, voting every four years and handing over power for four years to some government would necessarily be the best thing. Uh, I think um, in particular in those difficult times where m most people have no idea what the solution would be, including many politicians, you know, those problems are just so big. Um, I think it would be important that more people can come in with ideas, with projects that are being proposed and with voting on those uh, projects. So uh, I think we should just be uh, courageous to, to try it here and there and then see how to do it well and then to scale it up basically, that would be my approach. 